doctor en economía e investigador estadounidense, nos hablará sobre la confianza y cómo se construye al interior de nuestras organizaciones y se refleja en las claro. ventas. Uh, no hablo en, uh, español bien, entonces, I'm going to speak in English. Try to speak slowly, that's hard for me. There's translation, so if you want translation, uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand or something, someone will bring you uh, your phones. Okay, trust. Um, in the ancient world, the discovery of leverage was one of the most amazing things the Greeks ever found. Right? With leverage, you take a little bit of effort and produce a lot of output. So my work in the last 20 years has focused on arranging human beings to create leverage. And a key part of that leverage is trust. I can't work effectively with other people unless I trust that they will also do their part, unless I can trust that they will fulfill their promises. So I want to go through today and talk about the science of trust, thank you, the impact of trust, and then give you a lot of examples of how to build trust. So knowing what trust is, and trust is a behavior, it's not a feeling, it's not an idea, it's well established in the neuroscientific literature from research from many labs, including my own. But then implementing this is the key. So lots of examples and then specific actions and tools you can use to create trust within your own organizations and within the stock exchange. So this is an excerpt from my book, Trust Factor. Lots more detail in there, of course. Um, so this is 20 years of my life. How do you start a 20-year research program? The first thing is you make sure you're not crazy. Right, so how do you do that? You try to identify the mechanisms through which trust may affect economic performance. So as we started doing this, we identified pathways that we could begin to test. So in this work we published uh, in the early 2000s, cited more than a thousand times uh, by other researchers, we showed that trust has two mechanisms at least that affect economic performance. So I won't make you uh, uh, interpret those equations yourself, I'll do it for you. The first says that when trust is high, it reduces transaction, transaction costs. But if I don't have to monitor the other trading partners, I save a lot of that deadweight cost of monitoring. That's uh, very intuitive. The second equation is much more interesting to me. It says that when trust is high, the likelihood that a project will not be fulfilled, that someone will default on what they're supposed to do, is reduced. So now I have two mechanisms through which trust may affect economic performance, reduced transaction costs and a higher proportion of completed projects. So we test this model uh, against cross-country data. We discovered that trust is among the most powerful factors economists have ever found to identify the countries in which living standards are increasing and those which are stalled or decreasing. So high trust countries are high growth countries. They increase living standards. And they do that because both the formal and informal sectors are working effectively. Great, so this has a, a big impact. The World Bank flies me out, you know, how do we raise trust in these developing countries so we can accelerate growth? And as I talked about this, people would ask the most basic question about trust, which is, for a given environment, this talks about environments, for a given country or environment, why do two people who don't know each other exhibit trust at all? That's a good question. This tells me about environments. I don't know about people. So we began to study what happens in the human brain that tells us that Jaime I can trust and, oh, I can't see your name. What's your name? Jorge, who just spoke, clearly a sketchy guy. Don't want to trust him at all, right? How do I do that? We can't live in cities. We can't be around strangers unless we have something in our brains that say, Jaime good, Jorge bad, right? He's fine, don't worry. So a lot of you don't know each other in this room. Right? If I look around, I don't see anybody who's stressed out. But if you put, well, a couple people in back don't look so good to me, okay. But if you put a bunch of chimpanzees in a room like this, of which we share 99% of our genes, those animals will try to kill each other, right? Fur, blood is flying. So why are human beings different? What do we have in our brains that tell us we can trust somebody? Let's bring this down. So I want to show you an example of an experiment we ran. 
This is with a Japanese film crew, so she's Japanese. This is in Papua New Guinea. This is as far away from the Western world as you can get. This is in the Western Highlands rainforest. There are uh, no electricity, no running water, no bathrooms. So I spent a week embedded in this village. It takes a lot of permissions to get there. This is what these individuals in this village do, the men only. They do this dance before they have group activities. So we want to identify how these rituals help the brain uh, signal that now is time to be cooperative, now is time to trust. So again, I didn't want to impose a task on them, but what do you do normally before you do group work? So these men had never been to a doctor and dentist. We brought in generators, we built a hut. This is the rainforest and it rains, it's like machine gun fire, like you have to hide under this tarp that we built. And we took blood before and after to see if the mechanisms that we found in the United States and in Western Europe also hold in Papua New Guinea, which is literally living in the Stone Age. So we took before, blood before and after, and we found that a particular chemical the brain makes called oxytocin indeed was released in these men after they did this ritual dance. It increased from this uh, ritual and motivated them to uh, work hard for their community, to feel connected to those around us. So that's just what we do, right? We we create rituals, we create cultures, we create environments that allow us to connect to other people, including complete strangers, so that they can trust us. So I have literally been around the world studying trust, and from that was able to then identify these mechanisms in the brain that allow us to create leverage, my favorite word for today is leverage, so that we can increase trust within organizations and between people. Okay, so when we do this, we, we uh, were the first group to identify how to measure the brain's acute production of oxytocin. We developed a protocol where we can infuse synthetic oxytocin into human brains safely uh, through the nose, which I've done about 700 times safely. Um, so it tells us that our biology, the human brain, is designed to connect to other people. And, and oxytocin is a key part of that signaling mechanism that says, there's Jaime, he's safe, I want to interact with him, he seems fine to interact with, right? So if I don't have that, then I don't have this uh, ability to take social information from the people around me and turn that into action. So the key takeaways here is that human beings are extraordinarily sensitive to social information. That social information may induce the brain to make oxytocin, when that occurs, it not only motivates me to trust someone else, it motivates me to uh, care about his or her outcome. So oxytocin in particular increases our sense of empathy. So when my brain makes oxytocin, not only can I cognitively think, well, if I want to uh, uh, work with Luis, then I can think about what Luis wants. When I make oxytocin, now I feel, I have a better sense of what he, what he cares about. I can be a much more effective social creature because I have two mechanisms, a cognitive and an emotional mechanism that allow me to, uh, to uh, play football with him, to be more like a jazz team, right? I'm, I'm moving, I'm figuring out what he's doing. So that's what we've, we've evolved with in the human brain. Okay. Wonderful. How do we apply this, right? That's the next step. So we've done work with uh, psychiatric patients and uh, sexual abuse survivors and psychopaths and prisons and we've done a lot of clinical work to understand um, how the dysfunction in the brain's production of oxytocin and processing of it um, inhibits social behaviors but at some point companies started coming to my lab and saying hey we think trust is important within our organization you're supposed to be some kind of trust expert can you tell us how to build trust in your organization and because I'm a absolute nerd, as you have realized, my first response was, oh, well, we have this assay in blood, and they can take blood from your employees, and... <sighs> Sorry, translators, I'm talking fast. Right? And they would turn white, and they said, no, 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 you can't take blood from our employees. We need to know the principles. We need to know um, how to measure the foundations of trust um, without having to take blood. And so that seemed like a great challenge to me, right? If I'm going to be an expert in trust, I should be able to provide a set of tools and methodologies that tell us how to create an environment, like we saw in Papua New Guinea, in which 
uh, human beings will build trust with each other. Once we can measure that, then we have a lever, then we have an ability to increase trust and thereby increase performance. So when I think about how to do this, we started running experiments, first in my lab and then in organizations, in which we measured brain activity multiple ways and gave people tasks so we could measure their productivity. Right? So that's the place to start. We had amazing companies uh, that actually allowed us to uh, put their data in the book, uh, Zappos, Herman Miller, many others, where we actually did go into their companies and take blood from their employees and measure their productivity. Um, and from that, we developed a survey that allowed us to measure the foundations of trust without having to take blood. So we identified uh, factors that uh, underpin within organization trust, and those factors are all manageable. So the key point from a leadership perspective is that once you understand these foundations, you can create interventions to raise these factors, raise trust, and raise performance. So that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time on today. All right, so um, I think of you know, three ways to organize individuals at work for high performance. I call this the POP model. Um, the first is people, which is who you hire. Right? So you certainly want to hire for their technical skills, but also for culture fit. So I'm not going to talk about that today. That's a whole other uh, talk. But I'm going to talk more about how we organize individuals and how we give them a purpose. So I'm going to define those terms uh, quite carefully. And uh, much of this work now we've done uh, with lots of clients who have allowed us to come in and create interventions for them. So the examples are going to be from specific companies. I'll use their names. And by the way, if you want these slides, uh, email the organizers, someone, Valeria, and we'll send the slides to you. So you don't need to take pictures. Uh, everything is uh, freely available to you. OK, so it turns out that we identified eight factors that are the foundation for trust within organizations. By the way, why organizations? Right? Trust is a behavior. Where can I get better at this behavior? At home? Yeah, sure. Can I immediately go and go, I'm going to be a more trustworthy person now. Now I've got to practice. And at work is where you can practice that. Not only can you create more value when you have more effective high trust teams, but you begin to build the patterns of uh, behavior that signal that you're a trustworthy partner. So that's really the key. Uh, not only can you create value in the workplace, but you start to build up these habits. So I'll talk about habit change towards the end. So these eight foundations of trust somehow magically have the acronym oxytocin. I don't know how that happened, just super good luck, just wonderful, easy to remember luck. So the idea here is that you can identify, measure these factors, you can push on one or more of those factors, as you do that, you raise trust. When you combine that with purpose, knowing why we're doing what we're doing, I'll talk about that in a moment, now I have people who depend on me. It's fun to come to work, right? These people do what they're supposed to do. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. We're all working as a team. I get better service. I'm more engaged at work. When I do that, the neuroscience has this interesting prediction, which is supported by the data. Work becomes fun. Okay. Now I'm going to take a breath for the economist to have that small heart attack. Wait, work provides disutility. Work is bad. Not in this model. This says, you know what? If I understand that what I'm doing is important to the world, and if I work with people that I trust and care about me, I did come into work. This is great for me. Right? Not always, not every second of the day, but I'm going to give you some uh, hard data that we've collected from lots of different sources that say, actually, there's a reinforcing factor. Right? We're doing something important here. And the people I work with, I can really count on them. They can count on me. Now I have a feedback loop in the brain that says, hey, we come to work. It's fun. We're working hard. We get done. We take a break. We have a drink. And we do something important today with people who are uh, valuable. When we do that, then we reinforce this behavior. And we see, just like we saw in the developing countries, we see this uh, feedback loop in which greater value can be created is a positive feedback in the brain and in outcomes. So let me define each of these factors, the oxytocin factors, uh, in some detail and then give you some examples. So uh, here's the eight factors. I'll define them in just a moment. We create a survey um, with a training and development company called O-Factor that uh, allowed us to measure 
these factors in companies at scale. So if I'm taking blood from employees, that doesn't scale, right? So I'm going to give you data in just a moment from uh, 1,100 working adults in the United States who uh, answered our survey, and we looked at their productivity, their outcomes, their health, their welfare, so that we can really test this uh, model that I showed to you. So for each of these factors, I'm not only going to give you an example, I'm going to give you the relationship between each factor and overall trust. So because I'm interested in leverage, if that relationship, for the nerds in the room, this is the R squared, the explained variation, if I increased ovation and I got 2% more trust, not much leverage there. Because you see, each of these factors is highly related to trust. They are not statistically independent, so each of those factors is going to add to more than one when you add them together. But it means that I can change any one of these factors and get sufficient leverage that I can get uh, substantial impact on trust. And again, I'll give you data on that in a minute. So let's go to the first one. The first one's ovation. So this has a 61% relationship to overall trust. So I have leverage on this. This is recognizing high performers. Right? So now you're thinking, well, gee, uh, week one, when I was in business school, they talked about recognition that humans like to be recognized. This is not useful, Dr. Zach. What are you wasting our time for? Here's where the neuroscience gives me leverage. What's the neuroscience say? How do I create recognition? It's got to be close in time to when the goal's been met or exceeded. Close in time means like within a week. After a week, your brain has discounted this almost to zero. So close in time, it's more powerful when it's unexpected, when it comes from peers, when it's personal, when it's tangible. Right? So we finish a big project, and uh, Valeria, her team finishes this big project, like this conference, just to, and we know that Valeria loves chocolate more than anything in the world, right? And so um, we say, Valeria, you were amazing. Your team was so wonderful. Here's some most wonderful uh, Swiss chocolate for you and your team. Now I have this celebration. I recognize your high work, but what else do I do? I get a debrief. Tell us how you did this at our next All Hands meeting. So now I'm using this celebration to identify best practices, right? And whenever we've done this and we identify a team leader, that team leader will go, well, we started doing this, and then, oh, I had all this trouble, and we thought we lost all the data on the registrants, and then um, uh, Valentina helped us, and she saved all the data, and it saved us like two days of time. And so now we're discovering how to get better at what we're doing by identifying these high performers. And when we do this publicly, we also set aspirations for the rest of the team. And our community of individuals at work, we value high performers. We recognize high performers. And we want to create an environment where everybody can be a high performer. So uh, we worked with uh, the Container Store, a very interesting uh, store in the US that sells containers, super expensive, nice containers uh, for your house, and helped them repurpose Valentine's Day to something that they call We Love Our Employees Day. So the founders make a funny video. They send uh, gift baskets to all the employees. They uh, allow the um, customers to thank their favorite employees. They put 12-foot-high sign on their Dallas headquarters that say, says, we love our employees. If you fly into Dallas, if you look out the northern window, you'll see a sign still on their roof. It's been there for five or six years. It says, we love our employees. They want to know, they want the employees to know that they are successful because the employees are so good at what they do. Uh, average re this retail store, average retail training per year is about 10 hours a, a year. In the first year container store, you get over 100 hours of training. They invest in these employees. We'll talk about the importance of investment, too. But they really celebrate everything from um, a startup before the store opens to um, uh, daily huddles at the end of the day, talk about what they did, how important it was, and recognize the things that people did. OK, second is called expectation. Uh, this is a picture of the first time I went tandem skydiving. Scared out of my mind, if you've done this. So uh, this is not something I ever wanted to do, but I was uh, on a TV show on the Discovery Channel with Morgan Freeman. Me and Morgan were like, yeah. Uh, and they said, well, you're an expert on trust. We want to introduce you in some exciting way. Could we think of an exciting way to do that? And I've been thinking about experiments having to do with stress 
So high levels of stress inhibit the release of oxytocin. If I'm in stress mode, if I'm trying to survive, I'm not going to reach out to you unless you can help me survive. Right? I'm just trying to get through the next 10 minutes. Right? So I can't do this experiment under the people. It's too dangerous. Right? So I have to do it on myself. So I said, well, I have had this idea. Once I pitched it to Discovery Channel, I go, oh, perfect. That's great. Two guys, one parachute. I'll take my blood before and after and see what happens. OK, great. Now, here's the bad news. Oh, and the good news is I survived. Sorry. The, the bad news is there's this, uh, your brain's a very lazy organ. That sounds like a terrible thing. Why is it lazy? Your brain takes about 20% of your uh, caloric energy to run it. It has very high overhead. So the brain manages that high overhead by setting up default pathways, by essentially creating habits so that in similar environments you do the same thing. It also means it doesn't burn resources, it doesn't have to. So if I'm in a team and I'm not challenged to get better at something, I'm not going to produce oxytocin, which is metabolically costly. So chronic stress, bad for oxytocin release. Challenge stress, challenge stress is time limited, concrete goals, great for oxytocin release. So now Valeria and our team, we have to finish this project in the next two weeks. We are focused. We've got to get this thing done. We don't have time to be checking the Facebook email, all that stuff. We've got to focus on this thing. So from a leadership perspective, I want to design challenges for individuals because that gives you that focus that allows you to draw on the resources around you and come together to, uh, to solve this problem or finish this project you're working on. What happens when that challenge is over? Move to step one. Now we celebrate. Now we debrief. Now we talk about how we did it. Right? So there's a feedback loop here, which is just like you're working out with your muscles, challenge, rest, challenge, rest. So I want to design a challenge, give you a rest. So what happened in the skydiving experiment? My stress hormones went up about 400%. I was having panic attacks before, not a fan of heights, although it cured my fear of heights. And the first time you jump out of an airplane, you're not stressed anymore about that. Now, I've done this four other times for TV shows because it's a great gig, right? The last time I went, my, oh, sorry, first time, uh, stress hormones up 400%, oxytocin went up 12%. It's okay, 12% okay. That's, you know, like petting a puppy level. It's okay. The last time I did it, stress hormones up 20%, oxytocin up 200%. I've acclimated to this stressful environment, right? You know, it's, it's over in five minutes one way or another, right? That's how long, it's five minutes, right? So now I enjoy this, now I look forward to it. I dangle my feet outside the airplane at 12,000 feet, it doesn't bother me. Right? And I kind of have a bromance going with my skydive instructor. Who's cooler than a skydive, professional skydiver? Come on. All right, so that means that as I design challenges, I've got to begin to change them. Right? I can't give the same challenge over and over and over. I've got to begin to vary that. And then when the challenge is over, give you a chance to rest. Right? If you've ever done anything extreme like this, you're kind of giddy afterwards, and then you're exhausted. So if I gave you a, a big project and you finish it on three month project and you finish it on uh, Friday, the last thing I want to do is give you a huge new project on Monday. Right? Monday, I want to celebrate. I want to have an ovation. I want to do a debrief, give you a chance to go home on time, get caught up an email, and then start that new project on Wednesday or Thursday. Right? So stress, relax, stress, relax. That's how you're going to draw on these social resources. OK, the, the, oh, that's going backwards. How about that? Let's see. Let's fix it. OK, number three is called yield. We all like to live in a zero mistakes world. Right? Hate mistakes. The problem with that world is that you'll never get innovation. And in particular, if a person who works with you makes a mistake and you punish them for that, you yell at them, or you call them out in public. I can't believe you did this. Ah. What's your brain say? It says, oh, if I do something different and it doesn't work, I'm socially shamed. Social shame is exactly the same pathway in the brain as physical pain. It hurts. And what happens when you, something physically pains you? You don't do it again. Right? So when I uh, practice yield, I want to, after training, allow individuals to execute projects the way they see fit. 
from a management perspective, perspective, that means I've got to be the risk stop. Right? I want to check in with you. I'm going to make sure this project is not going the wrong direction. But it also means if you execute differently than um, I would have done it, I can identify opportunities for ovation, for improvement. You also get much bigger buy-in. If I'm micromanaging you, you have to do it this way. That's the way you always do it. Then I'm just a robot, right? But if I say, look, you've been trained, you're smart, execute this project the way you see fit. So in my group, we identify what we call leads. Each project has a lead. Your lead on this project, it's a three-month project. It's going to be hard. We've got this client that uh, has very high expectations. We'll build a team around that lead. And now we know who identify. We know who's in charge. And once you've been trained, we want you to execute. Right? So one way to think about this is to uh, train extensively and delegate generously. Right? Why do you want to delegate? I want to look for positive deviations, ways to find improvements. And then I want to celebrate those in the ovations and share them with the rest of the group. So I can't do that, and I'm not going to get buy-in from you as lead unless I give you some room to execute the way you see fit. So I love the, the five-minute daily huddle. Right? I ask three questions every day for my team. What did you do yesterday? What's your plan today? What do you need help with? Right? Let's be really clear on milestones. Then I give them weekly and monthly milestones. So here's where we are. We're making progress on milestones. Did we run into something? a problem, what should I be doing to help you? Do you have any questions? I said, great, we did this yesterday, we're on track, everything's good, boom, we're done. And if a stand-up huddle means we can't sit around, drink coffee, whatever, it's like right now. It's 9 o'clock, what do you need to do? Great. Do you need help? Good. Hey, we tried this thing, didn't work, we're not going to keep doing that, we thought it would save us time, it's not good. Okay, great. Let's move forward. So that way we can design challenges, we can empower teams, to be effective on their own, and we make sure that these projects do not go in the wrong direction. Okay. Now, if I take yield and put it on steroids, I get what we call transfer. So this is a picture of Peter Drucker. I served with Peter for 10 years at Claremont Graduate University uh, before he passed away. And a lot of Peter Drucker in the book, Peter had a really big influence on my thinking. Uh, Drucker's the one who coined the phrase knowledge worker in the 1960s. And so Drucker's view was that if you're a knowledge worker, which I think is everybody, everybody has knowledge in their heads, everyone uses technology, that you should be your own CEO. You should be in charge of your own career. So this is sometimes called job crafting, right? If I'm job crafting, now instead of assigning a project to you as a team member, I ask, who wants to work on this project? I let you bid to do this project, right? So that's what we do in my group. We bring in funded research. And we say, look, we've got this project. It's going to be three months. It's going to be six months. Here's the client. Who is interested in doing this? Who wants to take on this challenge? Well, that sounds pretty interesting. I'd really I'd like to work in this area. Great. We'll build a team around you. Right? That's your project. Right? We also know that if that person is not making progress, we'll switch project leads all the time. So uh, John's working on our project. He now is getting a week behind. Now he's two weeks behind. So you know what, John? This isn't working for reason. Let's mix it up. Give that to Nicholas. Great. He's going to move that around. It's not a punishment, it's just this isn't working. We've got to stay on target for the client, right? So we move project leads. Um, this gives you complete buy-in. We identify project leaders by name. Uh, there's a company, a software company in Seattle called Valve Software. They make a bunch of online games that some of you or your kids may play. And at Valve, they hire people, they give them desks on wheels, they move your desk around, and they say, find a group to work with that looks interesting to you. Whew. Think about that. Find an interesting group. So when you get hired, you move your desk around to different groups. They're working on this game, they're working on that game, they're working on the graphics, they're working on the coding, whatever it is. And you join that group. Now when the project's over, the group does a 360 while we'll evaluate each other. And then you identify, would I pay, have that person join my group again? So you're getting feedback, that group's getting feedback. right? If you can't find a group that wants you, you know that's not a good thing. You can't keep working here. So Google does the same thing. The average team uh, is together at Google for about three weeks. Right? So every three weeks, they're moving people in and out, moving to a different team. They want to have a little bit of chaos, controlled chaos, so that I'm bringing in new ideas. So you've got to be able to fit into the team, work on them, know your milestones, hit those milestones, move on, do something else. 
So constant movement, right? Also means that people are getting cross-trained, right? So once I give you control of this project, you've got to figure out what to do. You've got to train your people. I'm going to share that information in our debrief and our ovation, but now I'm actually creating these almost autonomous teams. So uh, many uh, other places do this. Um, Whole Foods runs each department as essentially a separate unit. That unit has its own profit and loss. The entire store sees that profit and loss. So if the meat department's losing money, everyone knows it. We've got to talk about how to fix that problem, maybe change the leadership, change the suppliers, whatever we're doing. So each department knows how they're doing, and department heads now talk to each other. Hey, what are you doing? Man, I've been losing money the last three months. This isn't good. Do you have any ideas for me? Mm, now we're pulling on those social resources, right? We're building trust, we're building those relationships because we have to be successful as a group, but also successful as individual teams. Okay, a couple more. As I said earlier, one of the factors that inhibits the brain to make oxytocin is high levels of chronic stress. Um, one of the ways that you can uh, get rid of chronic stress is to be very clear and transparent about not only where the organization's going, but why it's going where it's going, right? So if people don't know where the organization's going, people talk. So you're at the water cooler and we're having this conversation. Instead of focusing on delivering for that client, now we're chatting about, have you heard, are we getting sold? Are we in the bottom of laying off? Blah, blah. I don't want you to think about all that stuff. I want you to think about executing at the highest possible level. Right? So a number of organizations have now practiced radical transparency. So to the extent, besides uh, personally identifiable information, private information, they post everything online. So one of those is a social media uh, optimization company called Buffer. You can Google this later. They list every salary, stock ownership. They have a formula for the salary. They have three different levels of uh, hierarchy, that's all. If you live in New York or London, you get a bump because it's more expensive there, and that's it. You're in level one, two, or three. You can see how much everybody owns and how much everyone makes. It takes away all that weird discussion. Did you hear if he got a raise? Oh, no, he got a raise. I didn't get a raise. Did you get a raise? So, again, in my own group, we do lots of funded research. I'm assuming that when we write proposals that a bunch of people work on, the people who work for me can, can uh, multiply the one month I'm going to work on this project times 12 and figure out my annual salary. So at some point, some years ago, I kind of took a breath and I said, okay, guys, let's talk about why we have differences in salary. My salary is set by my university, so I don't control it. So here's what I do that you guys don't know about. I travel all the time. I've got to meet with funders. I've got to sit on all these committee meetings. I've got to go to, to wonderfully uh, uh, difficult places like Cartagena and give talks. I do all this stuff so that you know, we can be successful as a group. So you get to be in the lab running experiments, which I love to do, I'm such a nerd, but I'm doing all this other work to bring in money to make sure the ethics review works, to have our space organized, and so I'm doing all that work so you guys can be successful, and I've been doing this longer, so I make more money. So, and they're like, oh, all right, we didn't know all these other things that you did. So that's a real kind of weird conversation to have, but pretty much everybody gets out. So particularly in the information age when everyone has a camera, you know, think about, how much information we hold that eventually leaks out anyway. The more you release, the more people know what's happening, and again, importantly, why. So if you're gonna do a big initiative, a big change, instead of saying, as we often do, well, hello, team, I wanna tell you about this new policy that we're having, hold a town hall. Use all those brains that are in your organization, ask them for advice. Look, we're not doing really well on these two things, and we've gotta make some changes because it's bad for the organization, what do you guys think we should do? Take all that information in, be really open about it. And then when you make a decision as a leader, say, look, here's what we're gonna do. I listen to all you guys. I think the best options are this, these things. Here's why we're doing this. I think we leave out the why a lot, and humans like to know the why. The what helps me, at least I know where I'm going, but why tells me, oh yeah, this, this leader is thoughtful. This leader has put effort into really figuring out why this strategy he or she thinks may be the best for us. So including the why is actually quite important. Okay, so lots of open communication. Okay, a couple more opponents. Uh, one thing we're taught in school for some reason is that when you go to work, there's the work you, and then there's the home you. Right, so right, the, home, the work you is, you know, don't fraternize with the employees, don't be too friendly, you know, people won't respect you. But if we look at our neuroanatomy, 
our brains are built to form relationships with other people. You can have friends at work. If you're the boss, believe me, people know you sign the checks. It's okay, it's fine, right? You can be friendly with people. So many organizations now have thought about how to increase uh, trust and social relationships by building in opportunities to intentionally build relationships with people you work with. That could be uh, weekly happy, happy hours. That could be uh, fun events that you have. Uh, Zappos is a great one at this. They have events every week. They have a party bus, they have an open bar, they have a block party, people come, you can bring your friends, food, drinks. Right? Why does that uh, affect the bottom line? Sure, it costs them some money, but now instead of seeing Jaime at work, blah, 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 now I actually have a relationship with you. I know a little about you. So here's an example, something you can do. What happens when we walk into work? Hi, Jaime, how are you? Good, how are you? How's your weekend? Good. Walk away. Instead of saying, hi, how are you? Fill in the emotion that you see in someone's face. So now I say, hi, Jaime, you look happy, sad, worried, anxious, joyful. That's a whole different conversation now. Now I've recognized you as a human being, right? You have a personal life. You have emotions. You have fears. So oftentimes I come into work and I see someone who looks bad. They just don't look good. I said, well, you don't look good today. Are you okay? Um, you look tired. Oh, yeah, my kid was up with the flu, and I haven't slept in 48 hours. And my question is, do you need to be here? Is your team working okay? Are you on target? Because I don't think you, you can even, thanks for showing up, but I don't think it's a good, I'd rather have you go home, get some sleep, come back tomorrow full speed. If you're working at 25%, it really doesn't help me. Right? And it recognizes you as a high performer have a life. Right? This is a long game I'm talking about. I want you to be here. High performers are rare. I want to keep them in my network, right? So I want to take care of them. Another example, I have a woman who works for me, a PhD in my lab, who some years ago came into work and was like walking on air. And these are like, you know, they were my graduate students, so I've known them for a lot of, a lot of times, and they're all in their 30s, so I always want them to get married and make babies so I can hold little babies because my kids are too old. So I said, what? Well, you look so happy. Well, you're walking on air. What happened to you? You fall in love? What's going on? And she said, you know what? I started running about three months ago. I've lost 15 pounds. My sister and I are going to run a 10K for the first time in a couple weeks. I can't believe that you noticed. Right? And I didn't say, you look cute. Like, that, not appropriate. I just say, you look super happy. There's no problem with that. Right? No, it's not creepy. And she has told me many times, that 60 seconds when you recognize that I was happy, that I was having a great day, meant so much to me. And she said, after that, I want to work for you forever. Oh, she's a high performer. I want her to work for me forever. I don't want to lose her, right? So that's what I want to do. I want to recognize that human being. I want to build those caring relationships. Yeah, I sign her check. She knows that. I know that, right? I want her to be in charge of herself. I want her to manage her own career um, because if I give her the opportunity to flourish professionally and personally, she can stay with me. Right? These high performers are rare. Okay, uh, two more. This is hard to read that for some reason. This one is called Invest. So if you've been following this program, it may occur to you that the backward-looking annual review is not only a bad idea, but it stresses everybody out. It's not very useful. So from a neurologic perspective, am I waiting a year to give you feedback on your performance? It's irrelevant. It's just a stressor for the, for the supervisor and for the uh, employee. So. Um, Wow, this is real. So, see, I'm a Macintosh guy, and uh, we tried this last night, and it worked perfectly, but it's on a PC, so I'm blaming the, uh, the uh, PC people, Microsoft. Okay, invest. I should be giving you feedback all the time, at a minimum weekly, and if possible, sometimes daily. Right, that daily high level check-in, great, you're making progress, cool, what do you need from me? So this is very much kind of a servant leader model, right? It's inverting that standard pyramid I want the people around me who create value to be successful. My job as a leader is to help them create value and be successful. So if I'm using this backward looking review once a year to give you feedback, too little, too late has almost no effect on performance. If instead I'm giving you milestones, challenges all the time, feedback, recognizing when you do well, and when you don't do well, let's have a private conversation about that. The last thing you wanna do is embarrass somebody publicly and go, you terrible, you blew this project, blah, blah, blah. All that does is it create this pain response. You're never gonna try to do anything uh, 
uh, interesting or innovative again. So uh, praise in public, critique in private. But now, when I'm giving you this feedback, we have repurposed the annual review into a forward-looking, what I call, whole person review. Right? So let's sit down and talk about, once a year, about growth. Growth is something that people need to be happy, to be flourishing. So growth in three dimensions. The first is professional growth. Where do you want to be in the future? So I like to use provocative questions like, what do you want your next job to be? Let's talk about that. And sometimes that job is here, and sometimes it's not here. I had a woman in my group who said, I really want to work in the tech sector. I need to stay in California because of my husband, Facebook, Google. You know what? I know people at Facebook. Let me see if I can make some calls or emails and get you an interview. She got a job at Facebook. Why is that good for me? She's a high performer. She's in my network. And I got a person at Facebook, and we can do more projects with them. Good for me. And if she comes back to my group after three years at Facebook, they spend a lot of money training her on a bunch of tasks she can bring back to our group. All good for me. The world of high performers is small. Let's keep these people in our network. So what Google does is they have so-called boomerang employees. You work at Google, you're on a listserv, and they keep sending you information, and a lot of those Google employees will come back to Google after working elsewhere with that set of skills that some of their company paid for. So let's keep these people in our network. The second is personal growth. How's your family? How's your spouse? Are your kids doing well? The last thing I want is someone coming out of my office, pulling their hair out, going, I gotta quit. Uh, if my wife doesn't let us move, you know, my wife said, if we don't move back to Chicago near her family, uh, she's gonna leave me. I, I, we have to move to Chicago tomorrow. Let's talk about that. We have an office in Chicago. You wanna be in Chicago? Let's make that happen. Let's do it in a thoughtful way, right? We wanna keep you here because you're a high performer. So let's talk about not work-life balance, because there's no balance. It's work like integration. How's that integration working? If you're job crafting, and you want to work from Chicago or from Italy, and you're getting your work done, and you see your team um, often enough in the global world in which we live, and you're a high performer, great. As long as you're getting your, hitting your milestones, what do I care? Right? That's the world we live in now. Right? We're on airplanes, we're teleconferencing, we're meeting clients, we work wherever. I don't need you punching a time clock. I just want you to do the work. Right? So, Let's talk about how we do that. And then lastly, what I call spiritual growth, for lack of a better word, besides work and family, what else makes you feel great about being a human being? What else gives you, helps you give back to the community? Maybe it's volunteering in your kid's school, or my uh, colleague Beth, it was running. So she said, when we had this whole person review, she said, what I really wanna do is come in late two days a week so I can run in the morning. Cool, can someone come in, like answer the phone so it's, you know, so Yes, let's make that happen. She said, really? Yeah, it's important to you. That running is your spiritual practice. You gotta do that. If you don't do that, you're not gonna be feeling good about yourself. You're not gonna be a high performer. We've gotta work out those, those factors so that you are growing as an entire human being because I want you to keep working for us because you're a high performer. Okay, and lastly, uh, natural. Uh, the best example of this is uh, uh, Southwest Airli Airlines. You guys know the Southwest story. Herb Kelleher would put on funny hats and serve drinks and unload baggage, and he was on the front lines, and he was who he was. So it turns out that people who are too beautiful, too perfect, too smart, Juan Pablo, uh, we kind of hate them, right? Because they're godlike. But if you're a leader, you're not perfect. You're not a god. Say, look, we're working on this project. I don't know how to do this thing, but you guys know how to do it. Can you run with this? This would be great. It's going to be important for us. So in my group, uh, we have a bunch of really, so we have brain data is big data. We get gigabytes of data from people's brains. We build predictive models. Can we improve those models with things like machine learning? Maybe. We tried a little bit. So we're actually investing in this now. I have a bunch of graduate students who are super smart. I've probably read three books on machine learning. I'm not an expert. And I said, look, I'm gonna pay you guys for a couple months to pick a bunch of data sets and see if we can beat our predictive models with some kind of um, uh, artificial intelligence approach. And then they get all excited and they go, oh, we wanna use this to support vector machines. Well, I said, don't even tell me. I'll just pay for it. You got, I don't know how to do it, you guys do. If it works, then tell me about it. If it doesn't work, then we're just gonna stop doing it, right? Now they're excited, they own this project, it's their thing. If I lie and say, well, I think we should be doing it, People are going to figure that out right away. So if you're a little bit vulnerable, if you're just your authentic self at work, you go, look, 
we got to do these things. Our organization is changing. We've got to be ahead of the technology. We've got to be the innovators. You guys are young. You're smart. You're energetic. Here's some clear goals that we think we should hit. Can you guys run with this? Can you make this happen? I can't do it. I got 4,000 other things I got to do, but you guys are smart. Run with it. I'll check in with you weekly, and make sure we're making progress. If we're wasting time and money, then we can abort, we can do something else. But I think this is the direction we need to go. That's really engaging. So just letting yourself be seen at work, letting your emotions be seen, it's okay. We have good days, we have bad days, we're humans. So if we look at these eight factors, if we relate them as a group to organizational trust, they explain 100% of the variation in trust. In other words, those eight factors span the entire space of management, controllable factors that create a culture of trust. Now let's talk about purpose. So things, two kinds of purpose uh, we can think about in organizations. One I would call transactional purpose, actually how the processes of doing business, how we do business. I want to talk about uh, what I call transcendent purpose, why we exist as an organization. So Peter Drucker and uh, my other favorite management guru, uh, Edwards Deming, he said that at its core, every organization's purpose is to improve people's lives, right? The stock exchange in Columbia improves people's lives. It allocates capital to new businesses, to expanding businesses. It allows investors to get returns. It's very important. Right? It has a key role to play in society. So when we embrace that transcendent purpose, people actually are more motivated. So we run experiments. We said, look, here's a task. It's not very fun. It's entering data, and we're going to pay you 10 bucks an hour to do it. Or we say, you're entering data. This is for, um, for alumni for our university who can fund scholarships to help underprivileged students go to college here. Productivity is almost twice as high when you tell them the purpose of this. How, the, and the purpose is that social purpose, why this is great for the world. So purpose is another uh, stimulus for the production of oxytocin. We've shown in experiments. So now trust and purpose reinforce each other. I'm really motivated to be part of this team and work effectively. So let's begin to look at some data for this. So first, work out of Wharton showed that companies that are uh, judged to be the best places to work have much higher stock returns over long periods of time. So if they have higher stock returns, they must be creating uh, more profits. And then work we've done um, shows that if I look at employees, this is in US data from 2016, look at employees who work in the top quartile of uh, high trust organizations compared to the lowest quartile, we see uh, multiple measures of positive outcomes, right? So we see uh, much less chronic stress at work. Um, I think the word engagement in surveys is just useless because it's so overused. Are you engaged? How engaged are you from one to seven? But energy is a word I work a lot. At work, are you energized or are you de-energized? So if you walk through organizations, you all have done this, and you see people like this, you go, oh man, this place is not doing well. But they're walking around, hey, how are you? What's going on? Man, you have energy. That's the question I like. So that's a really nice uh, kind of summary of how this organization is working. So more energy at work, more productive, more joy at work, as the model predicts. Retention's a great measure, right? So you're going to keep working here. If turnover's high, to me, that's a poor sign in general. A greater alignment of purpose with the organization. We see much higher job satisfaction, of course, in high trust organizations. More innovation, this is in tasks we've actually given employees to do. Can they innovate better? They innovate better when trust is higher. Sick days is another nice objective measure of outcomes. So if you're in a high stress organization and your trust is low, your immune system may be compromised, you may be getting sick more, or you're taking a sick day because you're interviewing for another job. Both those are not good, right? Not a good sign. So fewer sick days. And then lastly, because we're looking at the whole person in this model, people are more satisfied with their lives outside of work when they work in high trust organizations. They are better parents, better spouses, better citizens, because they've got a good work-life integration. They're not coming home beat up, stressed out, unhappy. All right. So now the rubber hits the road. How do we actually implement this? So we do it systematically. So this is essentially the scientific method, the Deming model, uh, it's all the same approach, which is identify what we want to change, tell us how we're going to measure that, and then essentially run what I call a management experiment. Right? I love the word experiment as a leader because it says, look, this may not work. 
here's our problem. Our problem is a turnover. So we worked with, um, uh, we're recording this, so I can't say the name. Uh, one of the largest financial services companies that was bailed out in the U.S. during the big recession, whose name starts with an A. And they had a division in which turnover was 100% annual. 100% annual. So it takes, as you know, it takes about a year's salary to replace somebody. So they were just hiring, training, losing, hiring, training, losing. This is a losing proposition. So we saw that data. We ran our survey to measure the oxytocin factors. And the lowest of those factors was invest. So we generally recommend companies intervene on the lowest of the eight factors because all these factors have a concave effect on performance. Right? So if I go from the 20th percentile invest to the 30th, I get a bigger performance impact than going from 80th to 90th. So good. invest is really low. So I met with the head of this division. By the way, at this company, this is where uh, the Masters of the Universe work. The men and the women executives, they're all over six feet tall. They're all huge. This big Texan guy walked up and he said, oh, that's my division. Uh, I said, look, your invest is like in the 20th percentile. I did, this is terrible. No wonder people leave. He said, well, we don't invest because people leave. Okay, well, maybe the causation is going the other direction, my friend. So I said, look, let's, let's uh, create some programs to try to stimulate greater retention. You've trained these people. They're young. They're out of college. They have energy and they're doing a job that's not very interesting in the beginning, but give them a career ladder. How about giving them uh, an hour a month on the clock to meet with a career coach? Um, how about being clear about how they progress through the company, how they go from this division to the home office to uh, working globally, right? Let's, let's, let's give them a pattern, a, a, a structure, so they know actually how they can uh, build a career at this company, because these are young, energetic, smart people. Let's keep them around. So, Let's try, to, let's try these set of interventions, right? Let's do it. We're going to try to affect uh, retention. Let's do that thing for um, uh, get some data. Then let's run this thing. Uh, sorry, I'm going too fast. Let's run this thing for six months. Actually, we see changes within three months. So trust is a behavior. Your brain's lazy. Now I have a conflict. If you have a lazy brain, it means your behaviors, by the time you're an adult, are mostly locked in. So if I'm doing a culture intervention, I'm talking about behavior change. And the research shows it takes about three months to change a behavior. So we've created interventions where we essentially nicely nag you for three months to make these changes. Right? So here's the changes we're going to make. We're going to get some data. We call these neuro nudges. So we're going to send you uh, a little micro-learning video for 10 working days in a row. So you get up in the morning, you get to work, and you got a little video. It's a little uh, animated whiteboard video, but you could do any kind of intervention. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bug you for 10 days. Hey, remember working on this thing, we're getting better with Invest. So blah, 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 here's the stuff we're doing. This is why it's gonna be good for you as an employee. And then every week after those first 10 days, we're gonna send you a little survey. And just say, hey, remember we're getting better at Invest or Ovation or whatever, natural, and we're gonna do these things. Um, how's it going from one to five? Give us some feedback. So not only am I getting data as a leader, I'm now just nudging you. I'm your sweet little Jewish mother. I'm just saying, hey, honey, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing for three months. And then I'm going to reassess, rerun the survey. Right? We've all said we have a policy change. Let's just get better at these behaviors. So the, the nudges have specific behavioral things to do. It says, here's the science of invest. Do this thing today. After this video, go do this thing. Right? Or if we're doing ovation. So one of the ovation nudges I remember says, um, Here's the science of ovation. People like to be recognized. Tell two people you work with why you appreciate them. Now, right now, go do it right now. Oh, so I'm establishing this behavior change that I need to thank people for their extra effort. If I want extra effort, which is voluntary, it's intrinsic motivation, I've got to thank you. I can't just expect you to do things perfectly because they're human beings, they have emotions. Okay, let's try this for six months, see what happens. If it works, Cool, keep doing it, and then go back and try another factor. This is a constant process of just tweaking this culture for high trust, high performance, right? It can be automated. It's something that you can focus on. It's a dimension of leverage that is very powerful in terms of improving performance, and it recognizes individuals as the source of value creation, and individuals as human beings with emotions, with personal lives. So it's been very effective. So let me give you a couple examples. 
and a video showing you how you can do it in the finance realm, and then we'll have time for a question or two. Okay, okay so we've been working for the last three years with uh, local police departments in California. Um, the police in, in the United States are under a lot of uh, stress with uh, body cameras and videos, and, and they have a, a lot of trust issues, and maybe the same here in Colombia as well. So they want to build trust with their community. How do you do that? You're, you're a police officer. You have a problem, which is most of the people you interact with are nice, and then 5 or 10% of those are dangerous folks that may want to kill you. So you have to be kind of on edge all the time. So how do I build the patterns of behavior that allow me to express that I'm a trustworthy member of your community and not some kind of occupying military force? You start inside. So we've been working with police stations. This is uh, Newport Beach Police Department. So we work with them to build organizational trust, the pattern, so I'm practicing on my colleagues. I'm practicing on building trust internally so that I establish these patterns in my behavior outside the department. So when we kick off these, these uh, interventions, um, oftentimes I will say, look, employees, here's the data. No one's surprised. Everyone knows. Everyone can kind of guess. Here's the stuff we're good at. Here's the stuff we're not good at. So we're going to try to get better at one of these eight things for the next six months. And I always say, look, you don't have to watch the videos. You don't have to answer the question. We can't force you to do anything. It's anonymous. I, don't, I won't know if you do it or not. But these are great human behaviors. And if you practice this at work, guess what? You're going to take those home, and your spouse and your kids and your friends are going to actually have a better relationship with you. It's about relationships. So try it. I, I can't make you do anything, but if we want to get better as a community of people at work, these are some factors that are going to help improve those social behaviors so that we are more effective, our organization is more profitable, we can keep our jobs and actually enjoy what we're doing more. Who cannot want to do that? So generally, employees are pretty excited about these uh, kinds of interventions because they are very much pro-employee. They're about making their work lives better so they can be more productive. And uh, the result of being more productive is happiness. So I mentioned Zappos. Zappos for many years thought, we're going to make our employees happy. They have uh, Taco Tuesday, and they have uh, sumo wrestling, and they whatever. And it took me years to convince them the science shows the causations the opposite direction. It's not that happy employees are more productive. It's that when you're productive and recognized in particular, you're happy. Yeah, I did this hard project. It was cool. We had a whole team of us working on this, and we killed it. It was awesome. Right? Now I feel really good about my job. It's really about satisfaction. I did something important today. I worked hard, and it was important. I feel great about that. I've become an evangelist for that company. Okay? So that's what we've done with the uh, police departments that we've worked with, help them build trust internally, and cops are super paranoid kind of by disposition. They're just, they see the worst of humanity, so they're always kind of paranoid people. Uh, so let's get over that. At least the people you work with, you shouldn't be paranoid with these folks. Try to build up these behaviors so that when you go on the street and you're this giant dude, you're not intimidating. You're not um, uh, engaging in what we call dominance displays, right? If I get in your face, if I'm big, if my voice is deep, right? I don't want to cooperate with you. I want to dominate you, and that inhibits this oxytocin response, right? That's a fear response. I'd rather just say, hey, look, we heard there's some, uh, there was a break-in nearby. Can you tell me anything about it? Tell me what I want, right? That's a whole different ballgame, right? So same thing at work. I think sometimes we still have this, I'm the boss, God damn it, I'm going to tell you what to do, as opposed to, look, we got to work together. We like working here, right? We're doing some pretty cool stuff. Let's all get better at what we're doing by improving the way we interact with each other. So start from the inside, work out. Okay. Lastly, I know I've pretty much burned up your, all your brain power. I decided to create a little experiment for you all. Oh, here's some things to do. So at the, uh, within this framework, what are the things that are going to promote or inhibit oxytocin release? Don't make me wait. I'm not a client. That's a stressor. Right? To the extent you can help, don't make me wait. Right? Introduce yourself. I love the two-headed handshake. Be warm. Right? Okay. Handshake, kiss, hug, warmth. They're coming to see you. They're going to be a client of yours. Right? So let's use that. Good eye contact. If you're looking at a computer screen, so yeah, we're talking about your uh, retirement account, and they don't make eye contact with you, that's not what humans do. Right? You might as well talk to a computer. Right? 
built some relationships. Oh, you went to school in Barranquilla, or my Barranquilla people. You went to school in Barranquilla. Great. Uh, yeah, me too. I grew up there too. Right? We have some kind of relationship. So try to build a relationship. Talk about family and friends. Talk about photographs. Where'd you go to school? So build that personal relationship. Um, this is a service job. I think all jobs are service jobs. So use the word service. So I love to end a conversation with the word service. So I'm going to do that for you guys today. I'm thrilled to be here. I want to be of service to all of you. The last slide in two slides has my email. You can email me. I'm happy to talk to you, to do a phone call. I want to be of service to you all. Right? So I'm here. I want to be useful. This is what I do in my life. So think about that. I want to be of service to you. I'm your financial advisor. I'm your uh, uh, institutional advisor. I want to be of service to you. Use that word. I want to come out and help you. All right. Recognize problems. Practice empathy. Work on being warm. Right? It's learnable. I'm not naturally a super warm person. I've learned to be more empathic, more oxytocin focused, if you will. Um, and then be really concrete. Right? If, that, if that client has a problem, or they're coming to see you for some reason, say, look, this is what I think we should do. Really clear. If you're vague, then you're inducing a stressor. Right? So look, at least on a first cut. Right now, from the information I have, I think this is the direction we should go. Let's revisit this in a month or in three months and talk about whether it's the best, best uh, approach for you. And then be clear about how you know it's the best approach. So let's do this. Th think about going to the doctor. They say, look, you have this problem or these symptoms. We think it's caused by this. We're going to treat this thing. If it doesn't work in a week, we'll give you this antibiotic. If it doesn't work in a week, it may not be this thing. It may be something else. So let's try this. Let's try this intervention. See if it works. If we have evidence this is working, great. Stop. Right? If it doesn't, then let's go to plan B. So you'll know the problem is solved when the swelling goes away, when the pain goes away, whatever that is. Does that make sense? So really work on building those social behaviors. Again, all of this is sort of obvious in a way. Now we want to illustrate this with a little mini experiment I ran as if I were your investment advisor and you were a retail client. Why is this interesting? Because I've collected neurologic data to show what works and doesn't work in my little mini experiment. Hi, Paul Zach. Welcome to our office. Oh, much. Thank you. Uh, can we, can we just pause that for a second? You guys are too Thanks fast. It's your first time in here, right? Yes, Go back. it is. Great. Okay, stop. Oh, it's, they're so fast. They're so good IV, AV people. Thank you for being fast. So the neurologic data is a measure that we call immersion. So if I want to have an impact on you, I have to have you pay attention to me, but you have to be emotionally engaged by that conversation. That emotional engagement is driven by the brain's production of oxytocin. So when you're both attending to me and you care about what's going on, that's the emotional part, then you're immersed in this conversation. When you're highly immersed, then I can move you. I can get you to take an action. And this experience is more enjoyable and more memorable. So those are the things I care about, is creating leverage for action. So anyway, so I wrote a script. And you'll notice that the client, in this case, one of my colleagues, is wearing a bright green sensor on his forearm. So we have wearable technologies that measure the brain's peripheral nervous system, shoots it up to the cloud, and I've animated that data. So I'm going to sh show this short video, and then I'm going to show you what went well and what didn't go well, because I think there's learning in that as well. And then I'll be done. OK, so now we can play, and now you know what we're doing. Hi, I'm Paul Zach. Welcome to our office. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jorge Barraza. Thanks, Jorge. It's your first time in here, right? Yes, it is. Great. So we're going to talk about your retirement goals. So first, tell me how old you are. I'm 38 years old. OK. And married? Yeah, I'm married with four kids. Four kids. How old are they, and what are their names? Uh, there's Carolina. He's our, she's our oldest. She's nine years old. Then uh, Elias is five. Uh, Elena is four. And Sonia, our little one, is two years old. OK, so we're similar. So I'm actually 42. I also have four kids. And mine range from 15 to 7. Okay. And so yeah. the whole retirement thing seems really stressful. Like mm -hmm. you have another roughly 30 years to work. And before I did my CFA, I was like super stressed about like, how do I support my family, work hard enough, mm -hmm. have fun, and also have money for retirement. So um, since I got all that training and now I work here, I know a lot about how to design those kinds of programs for you so that you feel comfortable, that you can compound over time enough money so you can retire when you want to and retire comfortably but also have enough money to have fun support your family uh, put your kids to college so it's going to be a very easy program i'm going to work with you every step of the way 
and I'm going to be your key contact. So when you have questions about taxes, changing jobs, changing your family structure, whatever you're doing, I'm the person you're going to talk to. So I'm going to be with you hopefully your entire life as you retire. We're almost the same age anyway, so I'm not going to retire before you are. And we're going to have a chance to have this program evolve, your retirement program evolve as your career evolves, as your life plans evolve. And so we're going to build a nice, a great long-term relationship. So That's great. I want to go through the program with you in some okay. detail, make sure you have questions to ask. Okay. And before we do anything, next time you come in, let's have your wife come as well. So I want to meet her, have her meet me, have her meet our staff so that she also feels really comfortable that she has an opportunity to think about the advice we're giving her. It's your ultimate decision on what you do for retirement. All we can do is offer you advice based on our experience, the programs we've had, and the successes we've had with other clients. So it's a family decision. We want to make sure your whole family is involved and bring your kids in. We'd love to see them. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, let's start yes. talking about the program. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, so this immersion measure runs from zero to 10, higher is better. So good warm meeting, I think that was okay. Now we're talking about family stuff, that's great. This is when I say, oh, I'm, all this is false, of course. And I'm like, oh, I have four kids too, and uh, this is great. So this is this kind of bonding period. Not so good as this, I'm talking for too long. I should have let him say more things. I should have said a couple things and said, what do you think, right? So I was just giving him a little thing. Uh, this is where we start talking about retirement. So now he's re-engaging, oh, okay. This is why I'm here. I want to care about retirement, so he's engaged. I kept talking. I should have stopped, right? So blah, blah, blah. And then I said, bring your wife in. That's good. I'll give you this little peek. And then I said, okay, let's go through the program, right? So for me, again, this was uh, two minutes maybe. Should have been shorter. I think started out well, nice and warm, and then I got too excited to tell them what my qualifications were and why I'm going to help him. But I was trying to establish that. This is the part where I say, I'm going to be with you the whole time. I'm your key contact. So now it's very concrete. You have questions. I'm the person. I'm not going away. I'm going to be here. So I'm forming that kind of long-term relationship with you, right? And then this is just too much garbage, right? I should have stopped there and said, do you have any questions? Does this, does this feel like we're going to have a good working relationship? Tell me what you think. Oh, that would have produced a much bigger peak, right? So it's really kind of building that, that general warmth you certainly have to be competent. There's no question about it. But you can also say there are things you don't know. So I got a new uh, CPA recently, and I said, you know, here's what I'm looking for, and my other person retired, and she was with me for 15 years. And I said, I'm, I'm also worried about uh, foreign income. Like, sometimes we get foreign clients, and I'm not really sure on the taxes. He goes, you know what? I don't know about that either. But we have a, we have a big office, and there's a guy two doors down He's an expert on foreign tax stuff. So if you get foreign income, we'll just, we'll just loop him in. Oh, I love that. Sif saying, I am an expert on foreign. I wouldn't know. I mean, how do I know? He's, but he was very genuine. He was honest. He was you know, five years out of school. Like, that's great. If he doesn't know what to do, there's enough guys in his office he can figure it out. Right? So I like that a lot. I end up hiring him as my CPA because I liked his training, his energy, his honesty with me. So that's the same thing here, right? So look, we're going to work as a team. Right? I'm going to try to give you suggestions. You're the ultimate decision maker. My job is to inform you. My job is to help you. My job is to be of service to you. And my job is to be friendly with you, to be available to make phone calls. Here's my cell phone number. Right? We're going to be working together for the next 30 years. Right? So bring in your family. Bring your kids. Um, yeah, this is, this is a, you know, part of your improving your life. This is, I'm here to help your life be uh, less stressful, more productive, more uh, comfortable for you and your family. So. Um, anyway, so think about measurement. Right? I'm big on measurement, and there are ways to actually measure how to do this. So I just want to give you a little uh, summary of that. So a couple ideas you might want to take home uh, when you go back to the office on Monday. Uh, Peter Drucker famously said, don't tell me what a good meeting you had. Tell me what you're doing differently on Monday. So this is your Monday morning list in honor of Peter Drucker. Some things you can do. There are a lot of smart people in your organization, and maybe they're the youngest people. Maybe they're not tied to the old ways. Have someone else run a meeting, right? It's stressful for the youngsters. I right? say, so, you know what? Bob, you've been here a year. Time for you to run this meeting, our weekly all-hands meeting. Here's the agenda. You execute it. Or work with me on the agenda, even better. Um, second, ovations are cheap, right? The, the best money I spend personally in my group is beer. We have a lot of young people, we have a refrigerator, we stock it with beer. And you want to go up to work and, and have beers on the patio, go for it. I'm happy to pay for that. 
because you'll talk about girls or boys in movies, and they're going to talk about, oh, you're working on that project? Oh, you're the machine learning group. Oh, yeah, I heard about that, blah, blah, blah. Now we're forming these relationships. So give a chance to celebrate, talk about what we're doing right, and celebrate the victories you've got. And then a real simple takeaway is to get a snapshot of how we our culture is working, we use this simple one question. On a typical day, how much do you enjoy your job? If you're getting fives and sixes, that's pretty good. If you're getting two and threes, twos and threes, not so good, right? So really think about what people get at work besides the money, right? Money is a very weak motivator, but trust, joy, purpose are very powerful motivators for improved performance. They give you leverage to build relationships within the organization and with clients so that your organization can perform more effectively. So please reach out to me, there's an email, uh, there's a free uh, organizational trust survey at ofactorpulse.com. Uh, use it. We put tons of time and energy into it, so, uh, you know, help yourself. And email me if I can be of service to you. I'll be around the whole uh, next couple days, so happy to chat anytime. I think we were running a little late, so maybe we should do a coffee break, and then find me if you have any questions. Happy to talk to anybody uh, all the time I'm here, or by email. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you.